Good afternoon. Um, welcome to Sheffield Dockfest um, Q&A with Lucy Worsley. Uh, <laughs> um, my name's Emma Hindley. I'm uh, an executive producer and I've worked with Lucy a lot on various different programmes. She's my boss. <laughs> no, not really. Um, but anyway, I'm really delighted to welcome Lucy here because she's very busy. Uh, she's just hot-footed it from Loughborough, where she was giving one of her incredibly popular talks last night about murder. Um, she did a speech to 5,000 members of the WI at the Royal Albert Hall this Thursday uh, for their 100th anniversary. Um, you've been filming three new shows, I think it is, isn't it? Um, uh, writing a historical novel for teenagers, and of course there's always the day job at Historic Royal Palaces. So. Um, your Wikipedia entry describes you as an English historian, author, curator and television presenter. And on your own website, you describe yourself as, by day, chief curator at Historic Royal Palaces, by night, a writer of history books, and I'm occasionally to be spotted on the BBC. So before we get started on showing the clips, um, it's a, I have a very obvious question for the first one. How on earth do you make the time to do all that? There are, in fact, three of me. <laughs> it's not true. Um, I, I do work quite hard, but for me, my work is my pleasure. So all the different things that I do, which mainly involve museum curating. I mean, when people say, what are you? I say, I'm a museum curator. My day job is at Historic Royal Palaces, which is the independent charity that looks after the unoccupied royal palaces of London, <coughs> including Hampton Court Palace, the Tower of London, Kensington Palace, the Banqueting House in Whitehall, and Kew Palace in Kew Gardens. We get no money from the government or the royal family, and we deserve your financial support. <laughs> <laughs> so that's brilliant pitch. That's brilliant. what that's what I, that's what I that's what I do all day. That's how I define myself. But I do have some other hobbies that have sort of grown bigger over time, and I um, uh, and so, um, I, I, do people sometimes ask when do you write books? And the answer yes. is on the train, actually, because <laughs> I have a, a commute to Hampton Court Palace. That's um, 35 minutes each way, and for me, that's the perfect little length of time to sit down and. Does that not mean that you and you have some, to really manage your time? I mean, I presume you know every time you, you, you get a, a, a show booked in, you book that out of your your day job, as you describe it at, mm -hmm. at HRP. But how do you manage to do HRP? And because I mean, you know, I've made a number of things with you, and I know how much effort and time and and dedication it takes. So you've got that, HRP, and writing novels. So do you just, are you incredibly good at managing your time? You must be. Well, I don't know about that. It just seems to me like these are all enjoyable things to do. My work is play, it's intelligent play. So I'm very happy to spend quite a lot of time doing it. I don't go to the garden center or anything like that. You don't have a garden, probably. No, I don't, <laughs> I don't have a garden. <laughs> um, so alongside the day job and the book writing, so I just do a quick uh, resume of your television work. In just under five years, just five years, Lucy has appeared in nearly 40 hours of television. You presented and co-presented some 20 programmes. Um, so this afternoon, we're going to look at just a, a few of those. Um, the selection was incredibly difficult because um, I don't know, you know, I'm a, I, I love history, so I just love everything that you do, really. And so it was very, very difficult trying to find a, a small number of clips, but um, I was marvellously helped by Eleanor Schoons, who's produced this uh, for us. Um, and we had a really hard time choosing. So in the end, um, I went for a very conventional route, which is to start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and I know If Walls Could Talk wasn't your very first thing you ever presented, but it was your first sort of solo series uh, that was commissioned by Cassian Harrison at, at BBC Four in 2011. Um, I worry in hindsight that if some of the things that Hugo uh, McGregor, the director, and I as a series producer made you do, I slightly worry that in in hindsight, you might have refused to, to go anywhere near it had you known what we were going to make you do. So amongst other things, we got Lucy to sleep the night in a damp, chewed a bed in a freezing cold 16th century farmhouse in a, in a linen shift, uh, bake a hedgehog, we didn't make you eat it, 
uh, wash some linen with urine provided by a man called Brian, <laughs> and um, risk catching pneumonia as the first clip that we want to show will, um, will show how brave you are. I couldn't have done this, so can we look at the first clip, please? So, with the benefit of almost five years' worth of television experience, uh, would you still run into the sea in Bognor Regis in February? That was a bonkers thing to do, it wasn't was, it? It was. How did you persuade me? <laughs> Actually, I do remember the circumstances. You were all very nice to me that day because the previous day was the day you made me cry. Oh, no, I'm not going to mention that. Because <laughs> we were walking through the woods and I was dressed as a medieval peasant and I got so cold. And I didn't have the confidence to say, I'm really too cold to do this. So I just burst into tears. No, you didn't. What happened was you... you Lucy has incredible recall, I mean, the most astounding recall in terms of remembering her, her pieces to camera. I've never, ever come across anything like it. And so we were standing in this freezing cold, rainy forest, and she had a linen nightshirt on and a rough sort of cloak thing, holding a stick, and she couldn't remember the piece. And I went, to, I took her aside to say, are you all right? And she looked at me, and one tear fell, came down her cheek. And she just said, I'm too cold. And I was like, oh, God. So I had to rush her off and warm you up. And, get, and from then on, we always bought hot water bottles and heat packs and things like that. Yeah, I was going to show that clip. But the interesting thing is, the clip that appeared in the, in the program, you would never know it. You would just never know that you just cried because you were so cold. But we did give you a phobia of the cold, didn't we? Yes, yes. And I remember I was bribed to run into the sea now by being promised fish and chips afterwards. And we kept our, we kept our did, promise. We did. And also, because everyone was very worried that I was going to freak out and refuse to do any more, um, you got me some <laughs> jelly sandals so that my feet wouldn't be hurt by the stones. Do you yeah, remember that? Yeah, I've yeah. still got those jelly sandals. Oh, good. Yes, I'm very fond of them. So, OK, so... Where, where, in terms of the things that you, you, you do and you have done, um, along the lines of baking hedgehogs and, and um, sleeping in Tudor beds, where would you draw the line? Is there anything that you wouldn't do? Yes, but um, things that aren't to do with history, if anything's... No, provided we could contextualise it for you <laughs> <laughs> and give you enough uh, historical evidence. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I don't mind about doing crazy things, if I think there's a chance that somebody's going to watch it and A, learn something that they might not have already known, or B, um, just become interested in the whole idea of watching the history programme. The things that fill me with dread and horror are, I don't know, being on um, question time and things of that nature, or um, shows that aren't to do with history and in which I would be put into a strange environment and asked to perform on topics that I'm not really interested in or that I don't know about. So I've always been quite careful to direct my attention to topics that I really care about and have something to say about. However, provided it's, in an, it, it's an area that you're interested in, you wouldn't draw the line anywhere. Well, no, no, <laughs> not really. <laughs> I'm not trying to push you in. I just I think, think it's... I, I just, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to get at is the, there's the big dressing up debate, really. Um, and there's a story about a nameless BBC exec who, who apparently said that you're only allowed to have one through, you're only allowed to have three outfits per show, right? And so, so it's a good thing that person doesn't know how many outfits are appearing in our next show. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it, it is a, you know, there are historians and some critics that have said that dressing up or, or, or re recreating the past somehow. Sleeping a night in a Tudor bed, for example, um, doesn't, it has no relevance historically. I mean, I don't agree with that, but I was wondering how you deal with that criticism. Hmm. Well, um, I guess those people might have a different idea than I do about what the point of a history programme is. To me, it's the thin end of a wedge. And it can happen. I know that it happens because people have written to me to tell me that this has happened, that they may have watched a programme on a historical topic and then they may have read a book and then they may have attended an evening class and then they may have done an open university degree. That has happened in yeah, my experience amazing. because of something that we've worked on together. So that makes me very happy. So for me, the purpose of the programme is to hook somebody into a subject. And if that is through dressing up, then I'm happy to do that. So you can't, you can't offend me or um, 
make me lose the will to live by accusing me of dumbing down. That just shows that you're on a different zone of the intellectual forest than, than I am. And both zones are good zones to be in. They're just different from each other. And I do think that very often cloves, obviously cloves, can tell you a lot about life in the past if you speak to an actor who's going to be in a historical play. Laurence Olivier said this, the first thing you need to get right is the shoes because the height of your heels will determine <coughs> whether you are a Tudor person or an 18th century person or a person of today um, because body language is determined by these very fundamental things like the shape of your underclothes. And I think also because I'm a museum curator at heart, I like to use things to illustrate ideas, you know, real objects. And you can't be playing about and trying on historic costume because it would damage it. So I'm quite into two replicas to illustrate things like body language, um, codes of behavior and courtesy, gender relations. All of these things can be expressed through material culture, as historians call it, which is really just a fancy word for stuff. Uh, talking of which, um, I thought we'd look at um, a clip from Tales from the Royal Wardrobe, which was directed by Nick Gillen-Smith, exec by Lionel Mill for Tiger Aspect, and it was commissioned by Greg Sanderson at BBC Four, because this is exactly that. You're dressing in replica clothes, but I, I, I guess let's look at it, and then maybe we can talk about what, what it was that you felt that you got out of doing that scene. So can we look at clip two, please? Okay, okay. I guess, I mean, I... I I, I want to talk more about that idea, about the value, you know, what you think the value is of dressing up, cleaning a range, running into the sea. Because I know that I've, I've had discussions with historians who've said to me, as, as what part of the sort of creative process of coming up with those ideas, you know, it doesn't actually tell you anything about what it would have been like to be Elizabeth or it doesn't tell you anything about what it would have been like to be a Victorian lady seeking a sea cure. Or, I, just, I just wanted to talk a bit more about, about um, what you think the value is, I guess. Well, that, um, that gentleman who was in the clip there, he's my colleague, Mark Wallace, who works with us at Historic World Palaces. And he runs a company called Past Pleasures who provide all of our live interpretation. So one of the big features of historical palaces is that if you, if you come and visit, you will meet his, his staff wearing their costumes. And they quite often do a dressing sequence using that very replica of the Armada portrait dress that I was wearing there. It was commissioned for use to visitors. And uh, quite a lot of people do find it interesting to see what lies beneath. You know, um, and in the context of the programme, we've just been examining Elizabeth I's painted portrait, which is very unrealistic because she's so composed, icon like, painted up to the nines and wearing something. She's very stiff, isn't appears she? appears to be unwieldy. And um, when you dress in those clothes, you realise that you are actually unwieldy, unwieldy, which is an advantage because as the queen, you, you don't need to do anything. Everything is done for you. In fact, you don't want to be doing anything. You don't want to be wearing practical You probably clothes, can't actually do very much. You presumably. can't do very much. And one thing that you can't do is move quickly. And this is very important. Hurrying is only for servants in the 16th century. If you're the queen, there's absolutely no need for you to rush anywhere because everybody's going to wait for you, aren't they? <laughs> so those, those are points that can really brought, be brought home by the experience of dressing up in an outfit like that. And I'm sure many people would like to dress up in an outfit like that. Oh, yeah, you're not. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a wonderful opportunity that, that I've had. And I, I'm jealous of the lady who does it every day because she can get into that outfit so quickly. On when, her own? Yeah, well, with, with the help of one other colleague. Yes, I yeah, say. Because if you get used to getting in and out of these clothes, you, you, you learn all the shortcuts and you can do it really, really quickly. Our dressing took about um, three hours from start to finish. You're joking. It was really, really slow. Because wow. also, as well as putting on all the bits, each time, each bit had to be filmed three times being put on from different angles. Oh, OK. Yeah. All right, OK. <laughs> anyway, but how long would it actually 20, take 25 you? 25 bits to the costume. I don't know. If you were going to do the job properly, people talk about one to two hours wow. to, to get totally, totally, totally queened up, I expect. Um, but perhaps they would have expended the time differently than we would. We all struggle with the basics of doing up a corset and that sort of thing. Maybe she was concentrating more on, on makeup. And we did do a little scene about makeup with um, Professor Aileen Ribeiro, who is 
one of the country's leading art historians, professor at the Courtauld Institute of Art, a great expert in the constituent parts and the process of historic makeup. Also, the worst makeup artist I've ever encountered. <laughs> 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 she gave me this, this fantastic. I look like I've been bruised. Yeah, you I've been do look in pretty. The face when I had my uh, Tudor makeup yeah, on. Yeah, you do look pretty frightful. <laughs> um, so the next clip, um, we chose it for two reasons basically. Um, partly because it illustrates how your approach can make what would seem to be a very obscure subject very accessible. So in this case, it was a bit of a, a niche within a niche. Really, it was women in the 17th century, and you can't get much more niche than that to some degree um, and also the, it was because it illustrates the fact that you you go and talk to other experts so you're generally you don't you don't do sort of long pieces to camera expounding about what you think often in your shows you will go and meet other experts and you will talk to them and there's a real relationship that um, that, 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 that you create, I think, in the, with the people that you interview. Not all of them. Um, and so before we show, before we look at this particular clip, um, I was hoping you would have a think about how you get your, your experts to relax. And so let's look at the clip and then you can maybe answer it. I was just, um, <laughs> yes. I mean, I think there's not many presenters and get away with saying the word clitoris for a start, um, especially with your unique uh, we're pronouncing it, uh, which we'll come on to in a bit. Um, but I was wondering, how much of it do you think is, is about the atmosphere that you create in an interview, and how much of it is about the chemistry that you have with the interviewee? So for those two particularly, so the, the, the curator of the Peeps Library, who's now retired. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I was just yeah. wondering how much of it is about chemistry with that person, and how much of it is about you arriving thinking, right, I can have fun here? Well, um, I, I sometimes worry a little bit that men deliver pieces to camera and women get to interview people. Yeah. You know, that is a bit of a sort of yes. way that things yes, tend to happen. Absolutely. But I do love interviewing people, having said that, because um, it's fantastic because it's like having your own little university tutorial with the person in the world, who knows most about, I don't know whether it's Samuel Pepys's diaries or Aristotle or whatever the topic is, it's just fantastic, it's a real privilege to do that. And um, sometimes, sometimes particularly if they're university academics, I have often noticed that they might at first be a bit nervous. And I think that they are sometimes <coughs> worried about looking silly or, um, sort of lowering their respectability in the eyes of their peers. Um, and you can see why, because they are judged by their sort of honor as academics, which is nothing to do with the fact that if, if they, their, their values are different. Their values are about yeah. scholarship very often, and mine are about accessibility. So sometimes there's a bit of a culture clash there. But I think that often when we work with them and we tell them what we're doing, you can sort of draw them into your evil web sometimes. <laughs> Do you remember that one time when um, it was my old university teacher, my old university tutor, yes. turned up and he said, oh, here he is, here he is. Now today, you're going to put me into a torture mask and throw me into yes. the pond. Because we were talking about 17th century witch. Yeah, about witch. Yeah. And he was like, no, that's not going to happen. But we just started to talk about it and Work get him them. into it. And 45 minutes later, he was tying me up with rope, wasn't he? <laughs> did that feel like he a... He put the skull's bridle... I, he had to be restrained in the end. He did, yes. He, did. he got a bit carried away. Yeah. Did you... Was that like a... I had I'd forgotten about that. Was that like a kind of a, a little moment of triumph uh, of getting your old tutor to, <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to reenact? Um, I can understand it. If you come to a strange situation that you've not been to before yeah. and there's a camera there, then you're going to act defensively, aren't you? Yeah. So it's our job, isn't it? Absolutely. Just to get people Absolutely. To I don't, think, comfortable yeah, I don't think any of us realised quite how relaxed the Peeps librarian was going no, to be. No, he was, he was surprisingly relaxed. Yeah, he was surprisingly <laughs> relaxed. But charmingly so, yes, yes, um, yes. I like to think. So it's, um, very, it's, it's, very, um, it's, it's very good fun, actually, to see somebody who's looking a bit nervous and to try to work on them and make them enjoy it. Because basically that's my end goal, that they will go home thinking, yeah, I had, I had fun today. I talked about my subjects in a, in a new way. Yeah, and I, th I think it's... 
what's what's really interesting about the way that you approach things is that is that it's not about your your take on you know your thesis on 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 a on a subject so there isn't a huge there's always a certain amount of you doing pieces to camera and walking around and, and explaining what's going on but it doesn't have the same feel somehow hmm. as as some other television historians and I'm, i guess i'm trying to get to the bottom of what what that is i mean have you ever have you ever been tempted to sort of go down the slightly more sort of sharma or um you know the sort of much more sort of traditional um Seabag Montefiore type approach, you know, where there's a, a guy wandering around a landscape, expound, you know, talking about something. Well, I, I know I genuinely like interviewing people, and I think maybe it's something to do with BBC Four as well, where most of my programmes have been, most of my programmes have been made for BBC Four. And what is BBC Four fond of? It likes clever people talking about their own clever subject, doesn't it? I mean, that's why I like working for BBC Four. It just seems that that sort of contribution that they've got to make will be fully valued there. Yes, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a, it's a perfect fit in that sense. But then, you know, you, you've also done some stuff for BBC Two, you've done stuff for History Channel, you know, you've done other, and generally you've kept to the same, the same approach. Yes, I, I, just, I just enjoy interviewing people, it's fun. And you can tell, I think. You can really, really tell. Oh. Anyway. Um, so how my next question is how much of your tv stuff comes from you and your books and your sort of ideas and how much comes from conversations with people and how much of it comes from channel controllers and is there is there a kind of a is it a mix or is it all for, I, you know I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk about that oh different projects are formed in um different ways I, I realise that a lot of you are TV people, so you will already be aware that I'm just a sock puppet, <laughs> and that when I say something, it's not really me speaking. It's the work of six or seven other people in the background. I'm just sort of the mouthpiece for a massive team effort that's to do with research and background and finding the right place and finding the right people and finding the most interesting stories to talk about. So that's an aspect of TV that I really enjoy. It's very satisfying to work with a small group of people over an intense period of time and to create something together. Sometimes the very first germ of the idea, it has come from my head. Um, sometimes somebody has come to me and said, we were thinking about this. Are you interested? And then I have been. Um, we did a program earlier this year that was called A Night at Hampton Court which was uh, to show celebrate a of that in a minute. the fact. Oh, right, yes, it's coming up, isn't it? It was to celebrate the fact that Hampton Court Palace is 500 years old this year. Although I will now let you into a secret, because you look like you can keep one. Um, if you read <laughs> books about Hampton Court Palace, you will read that Cardinal Wolsey took over the site of the courtier's house of Hampton Court in the year 1514. <gasps> which was obviously, would have been 500 years last year. But last year in 2014, we wanted in our exhibitions to cover um, the Hanoverian accession of 1714. So we didn't want to be doing the Tudors last year. So one of our curators very cleverly went to the National Archives and discovered that Cardinal Wolsey bought the spade to dig the hole to begin the building work of transforming <laughs> the building into a bishop's palace in January 2015. <laughs> so we were able to claim the anniversary this year. And I had had the idea about a year ago that we should bake a birthday cake for Hampton Court Palace. And um, I thought it would be like the Great British Bake Off and we would bake cakes from different periods in the palace's history, in the palace kitchens, because we've got lots of wonderful kitchens, and see which was the best cake. And I spoke to some people about the BBC, at the BBC about that and they said, Yes and no. Yes, we like the idea of Hampton Court Palace 500 years, and we like the idea of a birthday, but we don't want the cakes. We want you instead to recreate the christening of the baby Prince Edward VI. So I'm not quite sure what happened there, but it was a great <laughs> result. <laughs> so I, was, I was actually turned out, it turned out to be totally thrilled to recreate the and christening. That's a completely different anniversary. VI. Uh, but it was the reason that we, 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 we framed it in terms of this is a special year to celebrate Hampton Court Palace. And it was right. about the most significant birth that had taken place. Yeah, it's the way you tell them, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So I was, I was very happy for that to have worked out the way that it did, but it wasn't quite, quite where we started from. I must admit that the Women's Institute 
uh, program that we've just finished making because it's the centenary. Uh, I was very proud that I was speaking to one of my friends about three years ago and she said, did you know this centenary is coming up? And I thought, yes, and like a homing missile. I, I let nobody say no to me until we'd been able to look at their, look at their history in the perfect year to do so. <laughs> um, so leading on from those thoughts around your research and ideas, and um, I thought we'd look at a clip from the first Georgians, which was a series that you did, uh, the German Kings Who Made Britain you did uh, for BBC Four. Um, and it was directed by Linda Sands, series produced by Seb Barfield, exec by Mike Poole at BBC Bristol. And you've worked with them quite a lot. And it was, uh, I think the BBC commission was Mark Bell. And it, this clip features a mural in Kensington Palace that, that you researched. It was, out, it was your own research, wasn't it, effectively, the, the, the courtier mural? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly which clip you're going to show, but I think it's the one that shows all the servants on yes, the wall. Which, exactly. Yes, which I had I'd written a book about just out of my own personal interest, which arose from being the curator of that building. But what was great about the series The First Georgians is that it was more than a series because it was made by the BBC in partnership with the Royal Collection, who were going to put on a big exhibition last year in 2014, the Tercentenary of the arrival of the uh, Georgian kings from Hanover. So there was um, there's a lot of different things happening. It, it became a bit of an anniversary last year. Um, and it was very gratifying to have a little hand in trying to build that into more than the sum of its parts. But it, it was quite a tough sell to Georgians because who knows? Well, when we started researching them at work, we started to do some audience research to think, how is this anniversary going to take shape? And we discovered that people knew about the Georgian age in general. They knew about lovely dresses, and they knew that the Georgians invented pleasure gardens and built the beautiful Georgian city of Bath, but they didn't know anything about the Georgian kings themselves, apart from that song from the Horrible the Street, you know, yeah. <laughs> where they appear as a boy band, and yeah. you get the mad one, the sad one, the <laughs> fat one, and the, and the other one. The bad one, that's right. So we had a bit of an uphill battle to try to humanise these yet, four different kings called George. And yet, this series is amongst the highest rating factual programmes of BBC Four. Yeah, yeah it ever. was. It went, it went down very well. And I think that's partly because, um, well, I don't know why that is, but it might possibly have been because people were quite surprised that these were interesting people. <laughs> they weren't just four grumpy Germans with the same name as each other. There were was, was stories there to be told yeah. that people I mean, there was, weren't familiar yeah. with already. Yeah, there's quite really a lot great. of sort of family trauma and drama and, you know, fathers oh, yeah. not speaking to sons. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. No, what's fantastic about horrible histories, and they are geniuses, the people who make horrible histories, is that uh, they, they're just the cherry on the top of a rich fruit cake. So in the song, the bad one is George I, who has locked up his wife in a remote German castle for adultery. It really happened. The sad one is George II, who has a mistress out of duty, but is sad because he really loves his wife. And then there's the, the mad one, and he's fantastically interesting because I, I believe he's, he's not mad. He was suffering from bipolar disorder. That's what I think the latest research supports. And then there's George the Fourth, the fat one, who's the gift that keeps on giving, <laughs> not least his trousers that we've filmed yeah. together, which are 54 <laughs> inches around the waist, yeah. one of my favourite historic artefacts in history. What's most interesting to me, I and mean, there's many interesting things about that scene, but I think what I find most interesting from what I know of you is that it allows you to get access to to the sort of people who are normally on the edges of history, who are kind of unknown people in a mural, who there isn't much written about. So the servants, the ladies in waiting, the, 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 the characters in history that don't normally get a look in. Um, and you've said that traditionally history has been written about the winners who tend to be dead, rich, white guys. Um, so I was wondering, do you, do you see yourself as a social historian, or is that, not a, is that not a description that you would give yourself? And also, um, how significant do you think it is that you're a woman? 
Ah, well, if you are female, you sort of automatically are positioned outside authority, which I'm very happy with because although I work in a very establishment sounding organization, historic royal palaces, what's always interested me is the nitty gritty dirty detail of that. And it interests me just because I have a sort of prurient mind, but also because that's what I hear visitors asking about every day. What the one thing that they want to know about is the servants, who emptied the loos, who washed the underpants, all that sort of thing. And if you ever have to take a class full of nine-year-olds around Hampton Court Palace, you quickly learn what sort of questions it is that they're going to, they're going to ask you. So that's why I, I would always be on the lookout for interesting, um, subversive, outside the ordinary type characters. And actually, what's great about kings and queens, um, <laughs> what's great about kings and queens is not just that they are kings and queens in positions of immense power, but also that they are the best documented people living on the planet of their day. Those are the people about whom it is possible to find out the most information because their lives are so well recorded and their bodily functions, their illnesses, every breath that they take, somebody's going to write it down because this information has, has um, currency. It, has political significance. If the king is ill, he might be going to die. It might mean that there's going to be a civil war. So that's why you get your spies from different countries hanging out at court and observing and recording everything. So that's why it's so fantastic to deal with royal subject matter for the richness of it. And, and also, um, isn't there some sort of weird rule of thumb that you get 5% more viewing figures if the program is about royalty? Probably, <laughs> probably. I have heard that. I have heard have said that as a sort of immutable fact of, of television life. Um, but the reason that I'm interested in them is because they repay salacious curiosity. Oh boy, do they do that. So if you had to describe yourself as a type of historian, how would you describe yourself? Oh, probably a social historian. Um, I, I, I don't... I, I would not like to say that the history of foreign affairs or constitutional history or the history of political power are not important. Of course they are. Yeah. That's just not the sort of historian that I am. And what's great about history is that there's room for lots of different types and they come and go and there are fads within the world of history. And it's not so long ago though that you wouldn't have found, it wouldn't have been intellectually respectable to exactly. look at the lives of women. Or, yeah. or I mean, 30 years ago, but now it's completely mainstream. Do you think it is? Because I still feel like um, when I describe, when you know, people say, oh, you know, what do you really like doing? And I say, well, I really like making social history programmes. And certain, I get a certain response from, shall we say, the slightly more academic end of the world or the more established historians end of the world, which is it's slightly, mm, okay, that's not the same as, as the sort of history of the book or the history of the academy or that mm. sort of thing. I was wondering well, if you feel any of that sort of slight... I guess every type of historian thinks that their own type of history is probably the best. Exactly. Uh, so maybe you're just speaking to a military historian on a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, respect, you can respect what the other person does even if you, Absolutely. Even if you don't do it yourself. And um, what's really fun in academic research is to work with somebody from a different field than your own because that's where you get interesting new sort of relationships and ideas. Yeah, and I, th up. I like to think that social historians have really um, energised the more academic end of history in the sense that, you know, there's things that both sides can give to each other, mm. which I think is, is really important. While we're on the subject of female historians, um, I'd like to give you a quote, mm -hmm. and I want you to... I'm sure you'll be able to know who it is. Anyway... One of the great problems has been that Henry, in a sense, I'm trying not to do a personation of him, has been absorbed by his wives, which is bizarre, but it's what you expect from feminised history. The fact that so many of the writers who write about this are women, and so much of their audience is a female audience, unhappy marriages are big box office. That'll be my friend Dave. Yeah. And <laughs> can you remember how you responded to your friend Dave? He is your friend Dave now, of course, but can you remember how you responded? No, I can't remember. <laughs> yes, you can. It was, it, was, it was a certain bird referred to. I, I, I think we perhaps bet, best pass on over that now that he is my, my friend Dave. But you know what he's saying there? I think that's, that's great. I think he was saying that as if it was a bad thing, but it's actually quite a good thing. <laughs> it's excellent that history has been feminised. Exactly. And it's good that 
unhappy marriage is a big box office, sort of, is it? Yes, we should know about these things. Yes, it is. You know, I just think anything that gets an audience really, as wide an audience as possible, as interested as possible in history is fine by me. Mm -hmm. Whether mm -hmm. it's about unhappy marriages or, or, or whatever else. I mean, what's interesting is that quote is quite old from David Starkey. Um, and yet it feels like the world has sort of overtaken him so much in only sort of five years or so. Oh, really? Okay. Well, I, I, I think so. I mean, obviously yeah. there's a big yeah. range of history programming, but I do think that um, the sort of social history, history that you make is, is incredibly popular in a very different way. Um, so anyway, you made it up. Dave and you, and you made it up enough to, to do this 500 oh, years yeah, so of Hampton Court. Yeah, yeah. Um, was it frosty at all on set at first? No, no, no. He, 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 he's not going to answer this year. He was, he, was, he was in my palace, right? Ah, <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. I was in charge. <laughs> but also, we actually, it was, it was, it was, we had a great time because we really needed his deep expert knowledge of the Tudor court. If you wanted to know what happened in Henry VIII's bedroom on the 9th of October, 1532, who would you ask but David Starkey? Because he has this card index that will tell you that he's been building up <laughs> over the last 40 years or so. I don't think there's anybody who knows more about the Lord Chamberlain's accounts than, than he does. So we had some fantastic, um, fruitful, um, discussions shall yes. we say you're going to show one of them now aren't you yes so the scene that i'm going to show has been it's become known by your telly acquaintances as the font row um and audience if you look really closely you'll notice there is actually a massive great big unresolved row in the middle of this scene but it was incredibly deftly glossed over both by lucy and by the by the team from the bbc bristol who made it um John Darcy, who's produced it, and Mike Poole exec it again. Um, <laughs> this is quite funny because you have to concentrate quite hard because you could. I mean, I could almost, I can almost feel the crew going. <gasps> <laughs> this is the one thing that we fell out about, and we did fall out about this very intensely. And you can see that I'm in a really bad mood in this clip. <laughs> but will I tell you what the thing was? You'll be disappointed. It was about the height of the altar railing in the font that was created. Well, what else was it going to be about? Ten to six, Chris. Anyway, let's look at the, it's um, clip five, please. <laughs> Did you notice I didn't let him get in the word edge? Oh, that's right, yes, 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 yes. The, the, the issue was that the font, I've got to explain this yes, now. Yes, no, you have, have to, to explain it. About it. Um, the, the font had these sort of, um, what would you call it, platforms rising up to a pinnacle. And each platform had a, a wall around it. And his point was that um, the walls should have been like altar rails at waist height, so you could see in. But the picture that we used to design the font clearly shows that it was full height. And to be fair, he did go away and he came back the next day and he said, I found a document that actually agrees that they were full height. It would have been very convenient and brilliant had I been able to say that to him there on the night, but I didn't have the information. Yeah, and he in was, in that instance, he was wrong. Yeah, he was on the night, but he, he, he came yeah, out, no, he he came out the, the next yes, day. He came out yes, the next day, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And I, I was, we'd, we'd had this model made in classic sort of time team fashion, you know, experts beavering away, getting all the sources together, creating the model. And what I wanted him to say, and you could see me going, do you like it? I wanted to say, yes, it's lovely. <laughs> 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 but he didn't say that, so I was crestfallen. <laughs> also, we fell out, I fell out with the directors about this you know that little figure of Cranmer there yes I thought it would have been the coolest thing in the world if that had been knitted <laughs> and I found somebody I had somebody lined up to I make us a knitted Cranmer I bet you did. and they said no this is going to be a serious uh, on project. on what grounds did they reject the knitted Cranmer it's going to be a serious project and knitted is silly and the little figure of Cranmer that you saw there, he's up in our office now, and a game has developed where he is hidden in extraordinary places. <laughs> so he's, he was in the loo for a long time, watching everybody was using it. And I oh, no, up, that's a bit weird. I opened up Cranmer the kitchen. watching you in the loo. <laughs> it was weird. I opened up the kitchen door the other day, and he was in the teapot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where he is now, little Cranmer. Oh, that's brilliant. That's the sort of thing that you guys at HRP... There's the crazy times yeah. we have at historic world palaces. Um, so, two-handers. Two-handers, so it's quite a, it's quite sort of in at the moment uh, in telly to have two presenters, sometimes three. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've done single 
you know, where you've presented the whole thing, you've done one-offs on your own, and you've done a few two-handers. And um, I'm just wondering what the challenges are, given that most of the time you present on your own. Um, and I was wondering, do you end up fighting over who gets to say what? <laughs> do you kind of out -ex try and out-expert each other? Or, or I was just wondering how that works. Oh, it's, it's, I, 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 I have worked with, with several very um, authoritative and distinguished presenters from whom I've just learned lots of loads of little, little tricks. That's what's in it for me. I must say, I do feel slightly uncomfortable about the fact that I'm usually paired with a man who's a lot older than I am. Mm. You know, what, what a cliche is mm. that? Shame that has to be like that. That seems to be what yeah. television um, requires. Um, what's difficult and we have all, always received advice about is how to be on the screen together. And when I was, when we were getting ready to do a night at Hampton Court, our boss at the BBC said, um, the gentleman called Cassian, he said, um, I'd like you to model yourselves on Britain's best presenting duo. And I said, okay, who's that then? He said, Anton Deck. <laughs> and it is incredible how they're able to be in the picture together and they're like one creature with four eyes. I, I don't know how they do that. So I said to Dave on the first day, I said, right now, Dave. You know, you, you, we're going to be like... We're do, you call be like him, do you call him Dave? Have you ever called him Dave? When, when I'm feeling naughty. Um, when we're going to be like Hampton Tech, and I won't tell you what he's... <laughs> 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 so we tried different ways of doing it. And I think in the end, you didn't see us sort of standing next to each other because we weren't... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We in that one, you're quite separate you do a piece to camera and then, and he, then does he does and, a piece. yeah and then there are some scenes you see us in the background walking about together so it looks like we're friends which we are in fact <laughs> the other problem was that if we were to be in the same shot he had to stand on a little box <laughs> um, yeah, um yes i mean i know you've had different experiences of working alongside. I'd never, I'd never, I know it's really stupid of me, but I had never thought about that thing about it's usually an older guy and you. <laughs> Funny that, isn't it? I'd have to work on something with you <laughs> and a, a younger woman. That, that would be, be good, nice. wouldn't it? Um, so talking of working with older men, um, how, I want to talk about da uh, strict, uh, dancing, oh, yes. uh, which is a series that Eleanor and I did uh, with you Last for summer. Greg, uh, Sons at BBC Four. Um, and I was wondering, I know, I know you secretly had some dance classes before we started shooting, which was really naughty. Um, but she went off and had ballet classes with a secret ballet teacher. Um, and that was really annoying for Ellen and I because, um, because obviously we wanted you to make mistakes all over the place. Um, I think, I think you will agree that mistakes were made. Well, yes, some, yeah, you managed to keep some of those in there just, just for us, obviously. Um, I was wondering, how nervous were you about dancing and meeting Len? Oh, well, I, I, I think I should tell the people who've come what the, uh, what the whole background to the project was. <laughs> Shall I? Yes, go on then. Well, um, three years ago, I got uh, married, and my now husband... Uh, said that I had to sign a prenuptial contract, which I agreed to do. I'm so glad you're telling this story. <laughs> it was a very short prenuptial contract. All it said was, you will never appear on Strictly Come Dancing. Because <laughs> he knew that of, out, of all the, out of all the entertaining shows that there are, that's the one I would really like, because of the sequence and the showing off. So I was just desperate to find a way around that. <laughs> So, so we just so we just made a three part series. So when, it, when it was mentioned that history come dancing was in the office, I was like, yeah, 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 I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that. And the idea was that Len would teach me dancing, and I might be able to teach him about history, although he's very interested in history already. Um, the downfall in the cunning plan was that it turns out, and Len wouldn't mind me saying this, I know, that he hasn't danced since 1975, <laughs> <laughs> when he gave up being a professional dancer. <laughs> and also, you only ever did Latin. And That's the other thing, Latin is Latin. his absolute yeah. speciality. And so some amazing pictures of him in his jumpsuits. Yes, yes. Absolutely astounding. Because he used to be the UK cha-cha-cha champion. Yes. And this was before he had his knee done as yes. well. Yes. And um, one of the dances we learned was the Charleston. Well, that's the scene we're going to show. You have to go like this. 
and you will notice that he always does it with that knee and never with that one because <laughs> it won't do it. <laughs> Um, and I thought, I, I thought when we when you started when we started the filming, you were both sort of a bit nervous of each other. Well, of course. And yes. so and so we we all thought, oh, the chemistry is going to be amazing. They're going to get on brilliantly. It's going to be fantastic. And so the first time they met in the first sort of filming, they were a bit sort of awkward with each other. We were like, oh my god, what are we going to do? And what happened was that slowly over the series, a genuine chemistry arose between you and... Well, that's because we've been through so many terrible experiences <laughs> together. <laughs> Getting up so early. <laughs> um, so the next clip is from Dancing Cheek to Cheek, uh, which Eleanor Schoon series produced, Emma Frank directed for Silver River, and it was commissioned by Greg Sanders at the BBC Four. And um, I cho we chose this clip because it's quite late in the shoot, and because we did genuinely shoot it relatively chronologically, um, by the third programme and the Charleston rehearsal, they had really got to know each other and were sort of flirting a bit, which um, I always find quite thrilling, given how um, nervous you were of in, in the first place. And I do think it really, it really shows the sort of chemistry that, that, you, that you got going together. So, yeah, clip five, please. No, clip six, sorry. Uh, oh, fond memories. Yeah, that was lovely. Mm -hmm. And you got to have your hair done. Marcel I did. wave. I did. What I learned from Len is the importance of giving it some razzle-dazzle. <laughs> and that's what professional dancers do, isn't it? I mean, we were, I remember before we came out, I was very nervous about remembering all the bits. And he said, oh, that doesn't matter. He said, come on loose, me old sausage. <laughs> we'll give it some razzle-dazzle. And that's, that's what it takes. Yeah, I could, I could see that I was counting in the finale there. Could you? <laughs> he wasn't. <laughs> no, well, he's, he's been doing it for that's a true, lot longer. That's true, it's in his feet, it's in his feet. And he, are you still dancing? Oh, yes, we're going to be dancing um, quite soon, yes. Do you mean on, on telly or, yes, or yes. generally? We, yes, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say. I think we, I, I, we're, we're going to be dancing quite soon. Oh, no, you can't. Do, come on, you, that's not fair. What are, you, what are you dancing in? Is it romance? It's all right. No, there's going to be a special big band evening. Oh, yes, Which is going to be on um, to celebrate 1945 and uh, VE Day. And Jules Holland's orchestra is going to play. And me and Len are going to do some dances from 1945. We're going to do the Lindy Hop. There you go. Yes. So you get to Lindy Hop together. Yes. Excellent. He has had his knee done now as well. <laughs> has he had his knee done? I think he has, yeah. I wasn't even aware that... It, well, I was aware that one of them was a bit dodgy, but... Um, Right, OK. Um, uh, so that was dressing up a go-go, that show, wasn't it? I mean, that was really... Well, d d d dancing and costume are so intimately linked. I mean, no, no, it could not be proved more clearly. We learnt from the 18th century the minuet, which is a very stiff, formal, fiendishly difficult dance, actually, that involves lots of sort of prancing about, wearing a very stiff, formal, immovable in outfit. And then we learnt the waltz, which is in the 19th century, and now men and women are dancing each, in each other's arms for the first time. That's very risque. And they're swirling around the floor. And that's why crinolines exist, because they swirl so nicely. They turn in beautiful circles. And then by the time we get to the 20th century, that dance there, the Charleston, women have got the vote. They're not wearing corsets anymore. They're going out to work. And in the Charleston, the woman breaks away from her partner, and she dances independently. It's a brilliant dance, the Charleston is. Everybody ought to know it. Never forget, is it the minuet, the, the, the one from the first, the first show mm -hmm. that you had to do? That was quite tricky, wasn't it? It was the big wig and We had to learn all these patterns yeah. that you have to follow on the floor. Yeah. And I was all right, because I was wearing this fantastic um, hooped dress, so no one could see my feet. So I was just making up the kind of uppy, downy, shuffly bit. But poor old Len was exposed. His yeah, he was slightly out of his place. comfort zone in the in the 17th century, yeah, 18th yeah. century, wasn't he? Yeah, but it's, it's genuinely a very a very tricky dance. When you see them doing it in um, period films, they they've always had someone like Darren, our dancing teacher, coaching them beforehand to make sure that they absolutely do it right. He was very bossy, Darren, wasn't he? Well, I think you have to be. <laughs> yes, well, with you two, you if certainly you're going to be had a dancing to be bossy. teacher. That it's very important that you get your pupils to do what you want them to do, and it's it's difficult. And you very cleverly stepped away from the, the, the R issue that I mentioned much earlier. The, how do you say it? Red tat row? Are you talking about my speech impediment? Well, I don't like <laughs> to call it an impediment because I, I just think of it as part of, part of you. But I guess it is a bit of a, uh, 
a talking point, isn't it? It has been in the past a talking point. Should you keep it? Should you try and get rid of it? Should you? And didn't you go and see a speech therapist or a, a dialogue coach? Or I, I, I do have trouble with the letter R. The letter R is problematic to me. And um, we were going to be working on a series called Fit to <laughs> R U L E. <laughs> and I thought, I, I'm going to really make an effort. You said it quite a bit in the end. I, I, I can say rule if I put my Ooh. mind to it. I thought I will go and see if I can, you know, perhaps be coached into pronouncing my R's perfectly. But the lady I went to see said that it is so deeply ingrained in me that I'd have to say R correctly as many times as I have said it wrongly. And then given that I've been alive for 41 years now, that would take me quite some time to break the habit of. And also, and I was very pleased about this, she says the reason I do it is because I have an abnormally long I tongue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, one thing that Lucy always it's does on skill. shoots for a new, a new crew who she hasn't met, as she demonstrates, the length of her tongue, don't you? You do. I, I, I you do. think they you find do. it deeply impressive. Yes, well, it is quite impressive. It Thank is quite you. impressive. Thank you. And so, I'm if you have a, as long a tongue as I do, it takes a lot of effort to manipulate it, and my tongue is a bit too lazy to say the letter R. I'm horrified that you went to see a speech therapist just over fit to rule. Oh, That's no, terrible. I, did. I, I wanted to. I wanted to generally to um, <laughs> to learn how to speak better, and basically, she wanted me to go to drama school and spend a year rebuilding my voice. And um, oh, why? can you just teach me something in maybe an hour? <laughs> <laughs> um, and she, she did build my confidence massively because she said it's amazing that I can speak as clearly as I do with as little flexibility as I have in my mouth. Really? Yes. I, yes. Oh, I, speak, like, I speak like a robot. I have the mouth of a robot. And somehow I managed to produce a noise. It's incredible. Amazing. Um, and so the last clip um, I'd like you to introduce. There are two new shows. One which we. Oh yes, yes. The last. Which which order are they in? Uh, it's WI first, and then the horses one. Oh I can't, right. Don't, yes, don't okay. know the title of the. Now this is this is this is a sneaky peek that you're going to get of two things that haven't been um, shown yet. And the first of them. Oh, we mentioned earlier about the WI, didn't we? Yes, yes. yes. This, this is the week in which the WI, the Women's Institute, is 100 years old. So we, Eleanor and um, Emma and I, have just finished, finished making a programme about 100 years of their history. And looking back on their history, it's quite interesting to sort of trace their lineage as a campaigning body. They have really, in their time, done some quite radical things like uh, well, they grew out of the suffragette movement in the first place. They campaigned for better education about venereal disease. They campaigned for equal pay for women way ahead of anybody 32 else. 32 years ahead of? Yes, uh, <coughs> ahead of the Equal Pay Act. And in more recent times, they have famously slow hand clapped Tony Blair and appeared naked in a charity calendar. So we've, we've taken a look at their surprisingly radical heritage I suppose and I think that the clip we're going to see now is <laughs> the clip isn't the most radical branch it's though not, it's not Let's the most radical it. topic that we covered <laughs> but this is a very special thing that you're going to see is one of the WI's holiest relics a tea urn <laughs> that was used by the very first group who met on the island of Anglesey in 1915. Let's see the, the fabulous tea. And then it goes straight on to the horses. Into? Yeah. Oh, okay. And then, and then you're going to see um, the what came next after Strictly Come Dancing, not History, History Come Dancing, Dancing to Tea. What came next after dancing? Um, which is that I learned to ride a horse. <laughs> you didn't look very impressed by that. Do you know how I'm tall impressed. and dangerous yeah, no, they're horses terrifying. are? I have such a healthy respect of horses, having hung out with them a bit. And the reason that I wanted to do this was to, to, to learn something new. I mean, it's like going to evening classes, making television programs in some senses. But also, <laughs> I was very interested in this topic because, weirdly, I did my, um, I did my PhD on the 17th century art of horsemanship. And I remember at the time thinking, this will hold no future benefit in life. But <laughs> it turned out it did. Because I, I was studying a very specific thing, the 17th century art of manège, or horse dancing. And the reason I came to this topic is because in my 20s, I was the curator of a building called Bolsover Castle that you will know, because it's just down the road from Sheffield. It belongs to English heritage. 
and I was employed there for six years to put on, to create some of the exhibitions and displays that you see there to this day. And I looked particularly into the life story of the man who built it, who was an expert in this very weird sport of getting horses to dance, which actually has um, wider significance in society because it is the art of leadership, actually. In the 17th century, if you control a nation, as a king does, you also have to be able to control an army, you have to be able to control a horse. It's, it's sort of fundamental to the idea of leadership in the early modern period. So I thought I would learn some, some uh, tricks, uh, as would have been performed in the 17th century riding house at uh, Vienna. And um, I'm happy to say that I did learn a sort of, I ended up being able to perform a sort of entry level manege move which is called the Hollywood Rear. So it's not really what they do in the Spanish riding school in Vienna, which is all sorts of amazingly beautiful horse ballet moves. If you can imagine in your mind's eye, they do that sort of ballet in the air, really. The Hollywood Rear is basically where your horse goes, Ooh, and then it comes out again. So that was the most difficult thing that I attempted to do. But what you're seeing in this clip, I believe, is from my very first riding lesson. Um, with two exceptions. Once when I went on a, 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 a riding trip with the Girl Guides when I was 15, that ended very badly because the horse trod on my foot. <laughs> and secondly, I once did a piece of camera on a horse. Yes, with Eleanor. Just because it made sense so to do <laughs> when we were making- You were side saddle balance. actually, yes, which so is that... really quite scary, actually a very scary position. And we had no idea that you'd never actually got I a horse been on, before. Well, the thing was, that horse whose name was Jeffrey. Yes, that's right, I forgot he was Jeffrey. A, he was an extra safe film horse. He'd been trained within an inch of his life. And uh, Jeffrey, the very safe horse, was not phased by, you know, the sound man's fuzzy thing that normally freaks out animals of all descriptions. And he wasn't phased out by the side saddle or by me or by anything. There was just one thing, weirdly, that frightened him. And that was the Jeffrey. silver the silver step ladder that I used to get onto him. He was frightened of the silver step ladder. Wow. I can't explain why. Um, before we finish, Lucy's very kindly offered to sign some books outside. There's a, there's a, Ooh, yeah, uh, I'm done uh, I know, I'm going to do that. I'm just, okay. just before I, so I don't forget. Okay, also, okay. I mustn't forget to mention the books. So she's going to do some book signing outside. And now let's, yeah, let's have some Q and A's. There's people with um, microphones, so you can't really see very well. Uh, has anybody got a question? You haven't. <gasps> yes. Oh yes, we've got a question over there. Um, I just wanted to ask if you had any advice for um, history students wanting to get into public history or curation. Um, yeah. What advice would you give me? Oh, yes. Well, if you're students? very serious, if you do a Google search of my name and my blog and how to get a job as a curator, you will find a whole post written to people, for people who are in your position, because I get asked this quite a lot. Um, the answer, and it's quite an unfair answer, is do work experience. Because anybody who's a museum or a heritage organization will be looking for people with experience. And the double blind, awful trap of this is that nobody's going to pay you to do work experience, are they? Um, but now it does seem that it is required by practically everybody who's got a job to offer, because there's so much competition now. So the thing that you really, really, really want, and you should kill your grandmother to get it, is a paid internship. Not a, if, it's, if it's an unpaid internship, I think that's an abuse of the word. There's no such thing in my mind as an unpaid internship. But an internship with a little, a little salary is rarer than rubies. That's what, you, that's what you need to get. I would recommend doing an, um, now, um, people generally seem to like to do an MA in museum studies. And the one at Leicester University is, is very good. It's very highly recommended. Um, and a lot of people who want to be a curator, which is how I started out, have a, have, do have a PhD in the subject um, these days. But also, I think that people should really ask themselves, do I want to be a curator? Because that's often used as a shorthand for a lot of other activities that exist within an arts organization. It's used as a shorthand for somebody who maybe does education or who does events management, and then there's the finance department, someone has to do the accounts, you know, all the functions of any large organization exist 
in a heritage environment, an art environment. And so a lot of people who work in historical palaces aren't working in the actual history side of the business, but they're enjoying being in a historical atmosphere. Anybody else? <gasps> ah, here's one, brilliant, at the front. Oh, hang on, just wait for the mic. Thank you. Hey, I was just wondering how you do your research and um, what sources you use for the programmes? Well, it depends what the programme is. And the answer is that, thankfully, this isn't, isn't, in, it isn't entirely my responsibility <laughs> because this is what Emma's team do. There's always a vast, you know, a range of people who are... The first thing we do is get the obvious books that are on the subject. And another thing that the dedicated researchers on the project do is phone up people who are expert in this field. And, and they irritate ask, them. They, <laughs> yes, and sometimes they find this deeply irritating. There's a way of doing it artfully and helpfully, I think. And one of the ways in which a good researcher does that is that they learn the subject before they ask the questions. I've had this myself. People phone me up and say, what year did Henry VIII die in? And I'm thinking, do you not even know how to use Wikipedia? <laughs> you know, before you bother me with that question. Um, and often the expert will lead you to another expert. And as I understand it for the researchers, this performs a dual function on a program like mine. Because firstly, they're looking for information. And, and secondly, they're also looking for potential contributors. So if the person speaks really well, they might end up being you know, on the screen and, and part of the program. Often. Um, a particular document is needed to illustrate a particular point. So that would be dug out of a record office. Occasionally we might go to the record office to see the original, but more often we will get a facsimile of it created, and then it would take, be taken to a more beautiful location. I'm going to tell the story of the easel. And there it would be displayed. And on one occasion at a certain uh, arts venue in London, we found that we had two replica paintings that I wanted to talk about. One was by Constable and one was by Turner. And we only had one easel. We needed an easel. The location was very expensive. Time was running out. The clock was ticking. And I thought, and I regret this now, I thought the best thing for me to do would be to go to the restaurant at that major arts museum and steal the easel that had their menu on it. <laughs> and I thought that the best way to carry off this, this mendacious act would be to act bold as brass, walk into the restaurant, not ask anybody anything, and just calmly take it away. And I did, and it was fantastic. We had our two easels, and we finished our filming, and it all went very well. Um, and then we heard over the radios, has anybody seen the blonde lady who just stole the easel <laughs> from the restaurant? <laughs> And then the head of security came up, and then we got thrown out. <laughs> I will never do that again. <laughs> Does anybody else have any more questions? Any, anybody else have a question? Ah, Ray. Oh, we'll come to you next. Yes, we'll come to you next. Hello, Lucy. Hello. Uh, as a self-defined social historian, how... Um, how do you take into account the cultures of past times in your judgment of, of what actually happened? The culture, yes, it, it's a very good question. Um, I think very often if people look at, say, the family of Henry VIII, they think, okay, he had a family, there were three children, there was the mother, it must have been a family just like ours. That's so wrong. People. You know, they even argue about whether there is such a thing as the concept of childhood as we would understand it in the 16th century. And very often, a television program or a work of popular history will gloss over a lot of those difficulties of, you know, just it, it, if you if you think about genuinely trying to express what the culture of the past was like. You might just give up. It might just blow your mind. You might just think this is impossible to do. So what I would try to do in a piece of public history is to pay a nod or just a little hint of some of those scholarly debates in the hope that somebody who's really examining what we're doing will be aware that a little door has been left open to say, this isn't quite what you think. You know, um, the romance of 
Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn cannot be seen as the romance of Kim Kardashian and the other bloke. Um, <laughs> 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 but I, I often feel like we're looking for the modern in the past in order to make it seem familiar enough to people, for people to engage with it. I mean, if you just present it as an entirely foreign country, people go, whoa, why would I want to go there? But if you make it seem to have something in common with our age, but also to be deeply, strangely different, then I think that's perhaps a more a more fertile approach. Well, is that roughly the, what you the, had in mind? Well, yes, more or less. Uh, the, the reason I asked this question yes. is, is because I'm a horse vet. And you're, you're a, what? A, a horse vet. A horse vet. Yes, Fantastic. and I was I was intrigued by how you managed to write a, a history of the art of equestrianism uh, when you couldn't ride. Ah, oh, yes, it's a very good question. <laughs> well, um, luckily, I worked alongside another PhD student who could ride, and what we were both examining from different angles was this particular manual of horsemanship that William Cavendish, the first Duke of Newcastle, 1593 to 1676, wrote and <laughs> published. <laughs> so um, her work was looking at it from a practical point of view, what was new about the tack and the moves that he was encouraging the horse to do. And I was particularly looking at his architectural patronage, i.e. the construction of the stable and of the riding house and the form it took and the design alterations that had changed over the, um, over the, you know, over the course of his building. But what, what I was left wanting to do was to know what it was actually like to ride the horse. So I was able to you know, present this as a research question, as it would be put in academic terms, as a reason for embarking upon an hour's fun TV program. And what I did learn is that um, I, I guess this won't be an, a major insight to anybody who can ride, but just how all-consuming it is. I think I had been guilty of thinking, right, he played around with his horses, nice little hobby for him. But the, the dedication, the sort of zen-like, yoga-like, meditative quality of actually riding really well came as a revelation to me. And one of our experts, a lady from Liverpool John Moores University, she pointed out to me, and this was also a revelation that blew my mind, that the word manage, which is the name of the writing place and the name of the art leads to our modern term management mm -hmm. because the art of controlling and um, mm -hmm. directing and um, coordinating something has so much in common with the art of being at one with your horse. It takes that same amount of abnegation of the self and dedication to the task in hand. I wish I'd been able to learn that as during my PhD, but unfortunately, riding lessons weren't part of what the university was offering. <laughs> I remember they start offering riding lessons to, to management trainees. Maybe that's maybe that's the that's well. The way it to is do it. it is not unknown as yeah, a sure. as a thing that you know people working in business might go and do because of the skills that you you learn from it. Um, all these Great. things are possible. I think they're heading up to the galleries. Was somebody going to ask something um, up there? There's somebody down yes, here let's, as let's well. Yes, let's have this lady this first. Lady here. Just, just call out because they've gone upstairs with the microphone. Okay. Oh, no, they've got a mic there. Where, where are you, uh, Where are we going? Just to this, this lady here. Thank you. Hello. Um, you've been in quite a privileged position that you've been able yeah. to essentially travel back in time and do some of the best things people get to do, you know, be the most luxurious or interesting or expensive, but you've also had some rough rides as well, but is there an era or experiences that you think, I'd like to do this a little bit longer? Oh, oh yes, question. that's a very good question, yes. Um, there are certainly things that I've done that I was so unhappy that they ended, like the Charleston. <laughs> <laughs> I loved doing the Charleston, it was, it was utterly brilliant. I can't tell you how brilliant it was. What it would be, perhaps be nice to do is just to have more time to explore things. Now, em Emma was cross with me for going and having these dancing lessons in preparation for the series. She doesn't realise, hey, I'm a good girl. I would always do my homework. If there was an avenue uh, yeah, of Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, beforehand. I wasn't surprised. I have to say I wasn't surprised. <laughs> I would surprised. definitely follow yes, it. Yes. Um, but B, um, and I know some of you are television people and know this, there is just no time when you're filming something. It's such a rush, rush, rush. Um, you're always behind yourself. There's never enough time to do anything properly. And I, it would be, and in fact, at work, we have talked about this and started to do this. Um, some of these living history type experiments um, are worth pursuing because of what you can learn from doing them. 
the example I often quote is um, the time when I spent the night in the Tudor bread that Emma refers to, actually. You may think, oh, spending the night in Tudor bread, oh, what's to learn from that? What I learned from it is the answer to something that had always puzzled me, because it was not a Tudor bed, it was a replica Tudor bed that they have at the Wheels and Downland Museum. And the bed is um, strung with rope. It goes up and down and side to side. And it's a bit like sleeping in a hammock. And when I'd looked at pictures of Tudor people in bed, I'd always wondered, why do they look like they're sleeping sitting up? And you notice these people are always sort of you know, like that in the bed. And I only realized through having done it that if your bed is strung with ropes, as many Tudor beds were, then you are forced to adopt the position of a banana. You can't lie flat in them. Can you lie flat in a hammock? No, you can't. <laughs> so that was something that I wouldn't have you know, been able to discover just from books. And at Hampton Court, we have a very long running sort of experiential archaeology project in the Tudor kitchens, where my colleagues, Mark Meltonville and all the other guys there, have really reconstructed the art of Tudor cookery by taking um, recipes, which aren't really recipes. They, things, they say things like, get a swan, break its neck, cook it. <laughs> That's the recipe for roast swan. But they have been, by using surviving um, fragments of, of cookware, being able to produce replicas of the knives, the bowls, the saucepans, the, the heating of the fire, and so on. And now they are able to say with confidence, this is the way that you roast a, a Tudor swan. Yeah, and you it's, turning it's learning through doing. Being a spit boy as well, didn't oh, you? Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I've Turning a bunch of chickens. Years. Anyone who goes to Hampton Court can be a spit boy for a little while. The, mm -hmm. the guy who's roosting will generally um, let you, let you, <laughs> let you have a go. They just, um, they just recruited a spit roasting apprentice, actually, ah. for the team. So I'm sorry, that's an opportunity that's just, just missed you by the lady who wanted to get <laughs> into public history, but it'll be, it'll open up again, I think, when the, when the existing spit roasting apprentice is fully trained. <laughs> Was there a question up at the top? Hello. So don't yes. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Hello. I'm Hi. sorry. I don't think I can really follow um, Spit Roasting Apprentice, but <laughs> never mind. Um, thank you ever so much, Lucy and Emma and team. One, for making it a little bit cooler to be a history geek. Um, but ah. I'm quite interested in how you got into TV. So when it came from the day job, was it something that you had aspired to do to get into television or were you approached? And what's maybe been your greatest challenge? That's a, I, people do often ask me this. And I would say that um, although I said earlier, I'm a museum curator and I do television on the side, I do see them as forming part of the same continuum because anybody who works in a museum will know that um, curators have to give uh, guided tours. They have to give talks in the evening to adult groups. Um, if there's a new exhibition, somebody has to stand up and talk about it on the local radio. So like any curator, I was doing a little bit of that, you know, a bit, a bit here and a bit there. And I just saw that as the continuation of the battle by other means. The reason I got my chance to do more is because Emma and her company um, spotted that they thought I would enjoy the chance to make a, a bigger series. And BBC Four very kindly took a, a punt on me. And I thought that would be, I thought, oh, that was all very nice, that'll be over. And I, I had no idea that it would, it would go down well and that I get the chance to do more things. So I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, the biggest challenge, um, I think keeping going through thick and thin, what I learned, I said what I learned from Len, Good, Len Goodman was the art of putting on razzle dazzle. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to keep yourself feeling fresh and energetic and um, dealing with some of the pressures that you get of, you know, helicopters going over and people throwing things at you and tramps trying to slosh you with beer and people, um, you know, who are, um, are just intent on, on disrupting whatever it is that you've, you've got going on. One time, this is the, the most amusing disruptive action that anybody did. We were filming a scene by the, um, the Menai Straits Bridge that goes into Anglesey. Can you picture this bridge? It's a great big high level sus suspension bridge. And I was down by the bank of the river and I was saying, oh yes, Menai Bridge, Anglesey, blah, blah, blah. And it was all filmed. And only later when they got back to the editing studio did they notice that one very cunning disruptive person had spent the whole afternoon 
walking very slowly and naturally across that bridge, but backwards. <laughs> And they'd done it so subtly and naturally that we hadn't even noticed. But of course, it made the whole afternoon's work was, was useless and wasted. <laughs> Great. I think we're done. Um, so, Lucy will be out signing, signing books. Thank you, Lucy. That was oh, thank you. Great. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you all for coming.